Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon. I want to kind of get this timeline correct so we can get it all right in our minds. You found out about the bank subpoena from Kamek on the 29th I mean, of, se of September 2020, right? That is correct, sir. And this meeting you had with the top lieutenants was what day? It was the same day, sir. So on the 29th, on the eighth floor, eighth floor, y'all got together and had a meeting about the subpoena and about Nate Paul, etc. Correct? That is correct. What happened in the in the uh, date order next on the 30th? Is that when you went to the FBI? Yes, correct. Okay. And then you sent uh, a text to the Attorney General. We did, yes, sir. What day was that sent? That was the next day. What next day? Well, the October 1st. Okay, October 1st. Yes, sir. And then you resigned October 2nd. That's correct, sir. All right, just so I can get it in my mind. You learned about the subpoena on the 29th of September. Yes. Y'all met the same day. Yes. You went to the FBI the next day. Yes. You sent a text on October 1st the next day. That's correct. And you also signed, all of you signed a letter, correct? Correct. And then the next day you resigned? Yes. Okay. So just so in case the jurors are wondering about the timeline and maybe they'll uh, wonder, uh, go back, Eric, if you would. Uh, Your Honor, one thing I want to mention, uh, Eric, would you stand up? You, you hear me say Eric. Uh, Your Honor, this is Eric Arroyo. He's our audiovisual guy that works at our office. I just, in case you were wondering who I was yelling at over there. All right, Eric, would you, um, AG Exhibit 170, go to Brickman 187. And let's just try to confirm in our minds that the documents match up to the timeline. Page 187. Okay. Here we are, and I think everybody can see this. We have a major problem. The kid has served a subpoena on a bank, showed up there in person at the bank with someone from world class. I need you guys to come back. You wrote that in text, true? Yes, sir. And that was on the 29th, right? That's on the 29th, yes. Okay. The next day, you went to the FBI, the September 30th, true? That's true, yes, sir. And the next day, October 1st, you sent General Paxson a text. Yes. Let's look at uh, AG Exhibit 127, Exhibit 31. Okay, here's the text. This is the text. You, d you deleted this text, right? I had received a copy of it from Miss Mace. Okay. And this is the text you sent the general? Yes, sir. On October 1? Yes, sir. Okay, and then the group of you folks uh, then signed a letter, is that right, on the same day? Yes, sir. Let's go, Eric, if you would, same exhibit, exhibit one. We're looking at exhibit 127, exhibit one. Very tedious, but we gotta look at this. We really need to break these out so this doesn't take this kind of time. Okay, here we are. 
This is the letter that the eight of, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of you signed, right? Yes, sir. And that was on October the 1st, true? That is true, sir. Okay. Let's take a look. Keep that October 1, 2020 date in your mind. Can you do that for me? I'll try, sir. Okay, let's look at AG Exhibit 434. You see that? That's the bar record of George P. Bush. You see that? I see what the document is. I think everybody can. Now look at the bottom. Look at the bottom entry. His law license was inactive for 10 years. See that? Look at when he requested to reactivate his license. Tell us all that date. Where you want to point it to me? 10-1-2020. Do you see that? I see the document says that, sir. What date is it? When he applied to activate his license. It says October 1st, 2020. Huh. Let me get this right in my mind. On October 1st, 2020, you sent the general a text that we saw, right? I did, yes, sir. On that same day, you signed a letter, seven of you, right? Yes, sir. And coincidentally, on that same day, George P. Bush, who ran against General Paxton, did he not? He did in the primary. George P. Bush applies to reactivate his law license. You see that? That's what that document appears to say. You ever hear that old saying, there are no coincidences in Austin? Actually, I don't. I'm, Never not, heard that. I'm not an Austin guy, so no, I haven't heard that one. There are no coincidences in Austin. You never heard that? No, I haven't. Okay. Now, let's, I'm trying to figure out the connection here. Before October 1st, you had already talked to Johnny Sutton, hadn't you? I had not. Somebody had, right? I believe so. Somebody within these seven people had, right? I believe so. And what's Johnny Sutton's relationship with George P. Bush? I have no idea. Don't know. Any. I have no idea if there's any. No clue. No. So the day after George P. Bush applies to reactivate his license, you resign. Is that right? I resigned on October 2nd, sir. Let's look at that. That is... House Manager Exhibit 291. Bring that up on the screen, please. House Manager Exhibit 291. Second page, please. That's your resignation letter? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, you told us before you resigned, you talked to people at the governor's office? Yes, I... Who? We, who? Your Honor, is, is, is he going to offer it? Because this is not in evidence. Which one? The exhibit you just put up. House Manager Exhibit 291, to the extent it's not in evidence, I move for admission. It's admitted. Thank you. Now, let's get back to the subject at hand. Who at the governor's office did you speak to before you resigned? Well, a couple of days before, um, we met with, I believe it was Jeff Oldham, who would have been at that time the governor's general counsel. I believe James Sullivan, who, is, who was at that time Deputy General Counsel, and I believe the Chief of Staff, Louis Sines, was in the meeting as well. Was anyone else in the meeting? Other than myself, and I believe Mr. Bangert and Mr. Brickman. I believe that's all. Did you talk to Mr. Hodge? No, 
He no. wouldn't have been in that meeting. He no. wasn't at the governor's office at that time. Right. Did any of you, the group that, that you know of, talk to Mr. Hodge? Not that I'm aware of. You know who I'm talking about, don't you? I know who Daniel Hodge is. Yeah, he was at one time the governor's chief of staff, but by this time, Louis, Louis Sines was chief right. of staff. Daniel Hodge is a lobbyist? I, that's my understanding. Sure. Why did y'all refer to yourselves as a cool kids club? I don't recognize that. You don't recognize it? I don't. Okay. Um, go back, Eric, to AG Exhibit 170. Your, te your testimony is that you folks, you, you eight folks, never referred to yourselves as the Cool Kids Club? My testimony is I, I don't recall me ever using that phrase. Okay, how about the others? I, sitting here right now, no. Okay. Um, do you recall ever being sent a text like, getting fired will make you a cool kid? Eric, go to Brinkman 203. Brickman 203, and this is exhibit. Okay, do you see the text there I'm referring to? Being fired will make you a cool kid. I, Mr. Busby, I see that, but I don't know if I, am I on that exchange? I don't, the message at the top, if someone could highlight that. I do have my, gla I do have my glasses on, but I'm trying to see it. Yeah, I, I don't see my name there. I don't think I was on that exchange, sir. So. So. No, after I left, I don't think so. Now, when did you find out about the second referral? When did you finally find out that, you know what, when I went to the FBI and I was telling them that this guy was subpoenaing uh, documents that had nothing to do with the referral, when did you find out that the documents that were being subpoenaed actually had everything to do with the second referral? When did you find that out? Mr. Busby, sitting here today, I don't, I don't recall when. Okay, let's look at same exhibit, Brickman 202. Y'all read about it in the news, didn't you? Well, again, sir, I don't think I'm on the. I don't think I'm on this text message. Okay, but just look at the text message I'm referring to. This is about alleged second complaint. Interesting. You see that language? Um, could you highlight it for me, please? Eric, could. Eric. See that language? They're referring to a news article, and they're for the first time learning that, in fact. Mr. Kamick had been sent a second referral directly from the DA's office, and that's what the subpoena regarded. Is that about the time you learned about this? Again, I don't have a memory of learning it from, from that. I mean, you guys were alarmed, you said. I think the word you used was, we were alarmed that this kid, as you called him, had sent a subpoena to a bank, and you believe that subpoena had nothing whatsoever to do with whether the FBI had violated Mr. Paul's rights. Do you have the second referral? You're going what, to see it in a minute. What did it, what did it relate to? That may no, help me. Just a second. I'm going to help you. Don't worry. I'm not going to. No, my objection is, Your Honor, he's twice, maybe seven times, I've, re I've resisted objecting because the witness, quite frankly, is handling him so well. However, he's now <laughs> cross-examined him about an email that he's not, or text messages he's not on. He doesn't know anything about. Now he's going to cross-examine him about a second referral, which the testimony is clear. He never saw and doesn't know. He's therefore asking, give it to me and before you ask me questions about it. So I object to him being asked about documents he knows not only nothing about, but is not part of. I'm trying to find out what was in his mind when he resigned and when he went to the FBI about what he didn't know. And I'm asking him about why the alarm. And the alarm is, Your Honor, 
I think he's told us that he didn't know about the second referral, and I'm trying to figure out when he learned about it. I, don't, I think the, world, the law is clear. It shouldn't be a question about documents as, that he has not seen in this situation, knows nothing about. I mean, he just said, I never saw the second referral. I don't know anything about it. And now he wants to, to sort of lead him through as he gets to do on cross about things having to do with documents he hasn't seen. So I, I object to that being inappropriate. And sustained. And that's the whole point. You didn't know about the second referral, did you? I did not. Right. And so you went to the FBI thinking this kid, as y'all called him, as you called him, should not be subpoenaing banks, right? I did think that. But you now know that if he was charged by the DA's office of Travis County to investigate big bid rigging, that that would be, in fact, something that he might subpoena, right? I actually don't know that. You don't know? I do not, I do not okay. know it. And since we're on the subject, let's look at, because you, you know now there were two referrals, okay. right? You know that. I think I know that because I've reviewed the internal report at one time. Okay. Let's look at the first referral. The first refer referral is, you're gonna to have to get into exhibit 127, exhibit three, as quickly as we can. This document is in evidence. I'd ask you to take a look at it once Eric gets it on our screen. Exhibit three, Eric, page three. All right, can you see that, sir? He's gonna to try to bring it up. Page three, Eric, bring it up so you can see it. You certainly were aware of this first referral from the Travis County DA's office, correct? At one time, I became aware of it, yes, sir. And this was something that Maxwell, Mr. Maxwell and Mr. Penley we're supposed to be handling, true? That, that is true. And Mr. Paxton, the general, did not believe that Mr. Penley was pursuing this matter appropriately. Isn't that true? He became to, he expressed that at some time, yes. He felt like that Penley, who was a former assistant U.S. attorney, and Maxwell, who was a former Texas Ranger, were not taking the referral seriously. Isn't that true? I don't know if I'd say it that way. Let me ask you this. If you, if you don't take a referral seriously, one thing you might do is not even log it into the system, right? I, I, again, I, I don't know if I would characterize it the way you have. Who would be responsible when a referral is made from the Office of District Attorney, Travis County, to the Attorney General's office to log that referral and open the investigation. Who would be responsible to do that? I mean, somebody in the division. Whose division? Well, it would either be law enforcement or criminal justice. This would be one that sort of both had concurrent. So ultimately, Mr. Penley or Mr. Maxwell? No, they, they were in charge of both of those divisions, Let's look at Exhibit 5 to Exhibit 127. Did you realize that neither Maxwell nor Penley ever even bothered to open an investigation when they received the referral? Um, the document you're showing me, I don't see my name on. We were not able to locate this referral in any of our databases. I want you to tell me as the first assistant, 
who's responsible for the day-to-day operations of the AG's office. How could it possibly be that when the Travis County DA's office feels like the people they would typically refer this to, that is, maybe the FBI, maybe the Texas Rangers, but she felt that they were conflicted, and so she sends this to the AG's office, why would it possibly be that you guys wouldn't even log it into the system? Help me understand how that possibly could happen. I I would have to ask Mr. Penley or Mr. Maxwell. I will do that. Weren't you ultimately responsible for making sure that your people did their jobs? I mean, ultimately, but as I've I've testified, Mr. Busby, and I'm sure you're aware, it's a large office with with a lot of matters, and I entrusted, in, in this case, Mr. Penley and Mr. Maxwell. Now, couldn't you see how maybe your boss might be frustrated who felt, you know he felt like he was targeted by the feds, right? He expressed that to you before, right? Is is he soliciting hearsay now after all these objections? Do you have an objection? Are you asking a question or do you have an objection? I have both. A question on the lead into an objection is, uh, he's asking for hearsay. I guess it must be a valid objection. He made it 30 times when I was talking. I don't know what that objection is, but I'm entitled to. Ask, I'm entitled to ask the man what he. I mean, he's told us multiple times about how Ken Paxton felt about this, that, and the other, and he knows how Ken Paxton feels about the feds, and that's what I'm asking. Let's just move on, gentlemen. Tell us how Ken Paxton felt about the feds. I mean, he did have some distrust of the feds. His primary distrust was the the state officials. And- mm-hmm. So can you understand why your boss might be frustrated with his two top lieutenants when they weren't doing their jobs and investigating the referral from the Travis County DA's office? I wouldn't characterize that as that, Mr. Busby, at all. And of course, when you talk about conflicts, I mean, they decided we're not going to send it to the Rangers and we're not going to send it um, to the FBI. But we know that Mr. Penley was a former with the feds, right? Mr. Penley was an assistant U.S. attorney for many years. And in, Mr. Dallas, in Dallas. Right. And, and, and Mr. Maxwell also had a past history, did he not? He did, and Mr. Paxton promoted him to the position that he held before I got there. Now, you told us that you, that you knew General Paxton was frustrated that neither Maxwell or Penley would investigate the referral, right? Actually, I said I couldn't agree with you. Uh Uh-huh. And so Mr. Uh, Paxton, General Paxton, wanted an outside party to do it, right? We discussed that. And more than one person was considered, isn't that right? That's correct. Uh, One of the people considered was a man named Joe Brown? Yes. Uh, You liked Joe, didn't you? I've, I've known Joe for years. I mean, you liked him. I've known him for years, and I, yes, I had a favorable view of him. Yes, sir. Uh, another one considered was a man by the name of Strickland? Uh, Cliff Strickland considered his name came up, yes. His name came up, and then they figured out that Cliff Strickland was no way going to work for 300 bucks an hour, right? I, I believe that's true, yeah. So instead, they settled in on a guy who was young, but all he had to do was investigate. They settled in on Kamek, right? Well, eventually, that's apparently what the Attorney General did, yes. And you actually, even though you claim it wasn't an interview, you spent 15 minutes with Mr. Kamek, did you not? I spent 15 minutes with Mr. Kamek. Because we know from the visitor logs, Exhibit 127, Exhibit 6, please put on the screen. We know from the visitor logs, we're going to have to figure out a way to break these out, Eric so this doesn't take so much time. We know from the logs, Joseph Brown came to the office on August 27, 2020 at 345 and spent two hours there, right? I, if they can... Can he enlarge that, sir? Uh, Eric, see there at the bottom on Joe Brown, it shows when he came in and when he left. Checked in, checked out. Bring that up. Ooh. 
Can you see that? I guess. And I'm, I'm not sorry. familiar with this document, but I'm sorry. Yeah. I May I approach the witness, Your Honor? Yeah, maybe it's easier. I'll show you the thing. Just wait to go to the mic to speak to him, though. Okay. Thank you. Confirm for me and the members of this jury that Joe Brown on August 27, 2020, spent two hours in the AG's office. I, I can confirm to you that this document says checked in August 27, 2020 at 3.45 p.m. And then it says checked out Thursday, August 27, 2020 at 5.45 p.m. And so Joe Brown's name is at the top. I'm, I'm okay. sorry, sir. That's Joseph right. Brown's name is at the top. Right. That's a visitor log. That's how we know who comes in the office and who leaves the office, right? I mean, I, I'll assume that that is true, um, but I, I don't know if I've ever seen one of these before. And let's look, get, look at the next page. Here's a visitor log for Brandon Kamick. Do you see that? I do, sir. Go to the bottom, Eric. Even I'm having trouble reading that, but it looks like... What? Just, why don't you tell us what it says? It well, says... I mean, it's cut off uh, on this copy, but it, it does say August 26, 2020, 3.08 p.m., it says KEDN, we can assume that's checked in. Um, and then it says KED out August 26, 2020 at 438. So would he stay an hour and a half or more in the office? That's what this document says, yes. So sir. he came in on the 26th, that is Mr. Kamick, stayed an hour and a half, and then Mr. Brown came in the next day and stayed two hours. Is that true? Th that, that is correct. Okay. May I approach the witness? And we know, because we have your daily calendar, that you listed in your calendar times and you were considering. You mentioned Cliff Strickland, you mentioned Joe Brown, right? I did. If this was so illegal and so out of bounds and so egregious, why the devil are you meeting with these people? I don't understand the question. I'm trying sir. to figure out why, if you thought, hey, I, we don't, Penley's doing his job. The former AUSA is investigating the feds. The former t uh, Texas Ranger is investigating uh, the feds or the magistrates or the DPS. Why would you be meeting with several lawyers as outside counsel to do the very same job? Well, it wasn't to do the very same job. Well, why, you, help me understand then why you met with, with Joe Brown. Why did you think it was just a, a, a pleasure call? No. He just showed up for two hours for no reason? No, I'm not saying that, sir. Okay, you knew why he was there. You knew he was being considered for outside counsel to take over the job that Penley wasn't doing, didn't you? No. We know from your logs... Is this exhibit 127? You didn't put a, a label on it. The logs. Pull up 127, please. One moment, Your Honor. All right, are these your, this your daily calendar? It's my physical daily calendar, yes. This is what you keep on your desk to make notes, like here's what I want to accomplish today and some notes about what you do? Yeah, some, yes, sir. Okay, let's go. Uh, we're looking at 
Board of Managers 558, and Eric, if you don't mind, turn to page 98. It's bait stamped there at the bottom. We see a name on that, that document, do we not? You see the name Cliff Strickland? Yeah, I see a couple of names, but I do see Cliff Strickland, yes. Okay, and can you tell us all why you wrote Cliff Strickland's name in your, in your daily calendar? My guess is General Paxton men mentioned him. I, I, I know who that is. I knew his father. I, I know his father. Sure, and you were supposed to check him out, see what his hourly rate was? I don't know if that's true. I think, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Right. But you do know his hourly rate's 800 bucks, don't you? I'm not surprised that it's 800, but I don't know if I know that. Yeah. Um, that's too expensive for outside counsel, is it not? Um, I would think it's out. It's yeah, I mean, even this, I mean, we have some world class, probably the world class lawyers here, they're only getting paid 500 bucks an hour. Yeah. You knew that. Yeah. What's your right? Huh? What's your right? Well, you'll find out soon enough. Yeah. Um, so Cliff Strickland was too expensive for the outside counsel gig, true? I, what I recall is that Cliff Strickland denied being willing to assist in this matter. So let's go over to page 100 of the same document. He denied doing the work because he wasn't going to get paid his hourly rate. That's the reason. Is that not right? Again, Mr. Busby, I don't recall that. Now let's go over to page 100. You wrote some other notes, but you put, I like Joe. That's Joe Brown, right? I believe that's so, yeah. So you had written in your, law, in your notes Strickland's name, Joe's name. We already know that you met with Kamek for at least 15 minutes, although you've told us all that wasn't really an interview. Why don't you tell us why you're doing this? If you, you were so adamant we weren't going to use outside counsel and you thought it was wrong and you had all these objections to it. Tell us why you, you were going through the motions here. I wasn't going through the motions. If you look at the notes below, sir, after I met with Mr. Brown, I met with Mr. Penley. And you'll see in parentheses it says DM out. That's referring to David Maxwell. The outside counsel we were looking at was to ex to assist Mr. Penley and Mr. Maxwell. That was always my understanding. That was always my expectation. Right. But see, Mr. Penley and Mr. Maxwell weren't doing anything. See, I disagree with that, sir. They didn't even open a file. They kept asking Mr. Paul and his attorneys for documents, and they wouldn't give them documents. Did they open a file? I, again, sir, I don't know. I know, that, I know that they were working on it because... At different points in time, they, they told me they were. They had meetings. They met with, 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 with Mr. Paul. They met with, with Mr. Wynn. They kept asking for documents. Mr. Penley repeatedly expressed his frustrations that Mr. Paul and his counsel were not cooperating. You were so against the idea that you told Mr. Vassar to draft a contract. Isn't I don't believe right? I did that, sir. Well, that's what he says. Well, I... I don't believe I did that, sir. Do you know that he drafted a contract for Mr. Didn't. Brown and for Mr. Kamek? I know he drafted one for Kamek because that was later. You, you showed that to me this morning. I don't know about Mr. Brown. One of the things that outside counsel has to disclose is whether he or she has conflicts that would prevent them from taking on an outside matter, right? That is, that is true, sir. Let's look at Exhibit 127, Exhibit 8. As he's pulling that page up, you also told Vassar, we need to keep this on as short of a leash as possible. We don't want it running away, right? That doesn't sound like me. 
All right, we'll ask Vassar that when Do you he have shows that? I, that that language. Well, that's what he said in his interview, but we'll ask him directly. That, yeah, that language doesn't sound like Jeff Mateer. So let's look at the correspondence between you now. Where in the in the chain of command, where is Vassar in relation to you? Let's see, at this time, he is deputy for legal counsel, and he would be a direct report to me. Through assisting me on that would, would be Mr. Bangert. Okay, so he, you would consider him a direct subordinate? He is a direct subordinate, but specifically on the, because, because Ryan Bangert had been in that position, he, he worked very closely with him. So Eric, if you would, in this exhibit, turn to the last page, and we can see Vassar, the email, that he sent an outside counsel contract draft. You see that? I mean, I, I've never, I'm not, I don't think I'm on this. I, I've not seen it I'm before. I'm asking if you see it now. If, I mean, we can see it on the screen. Sure. I see it on the screen. Vassar's your direct subordinate. Again, through Banger. Yes. He's sending an outside counsel contract draft. Please, it says, please see attached. Yeah. And then in response, Mr. Brown lays out some things that might or might not be conflicts to take on the, the representation. Do you see that? Let, let me, yeah, let me read it. Can you make that bigger, sir? What was bigger? <laughs> what about the first paragraph first? I'm sorry, the first paragraph first, sir. I see in the first paragraph he talks about malpractice insurance. Right. Second paragraph, sir. You see what the scope of the work is as you're reading that? I, I read it, sir, yes. The scope is that I will investigate, fully investigate the circumstances related to the referral received and provide a report related to any potential criminal charges. That's right. I see what it says, sir. And let's go to the first page, the next page, I should say, Eric. More correspondence between Vassar and Mr. Brown related to the draft. See that? Now, can they, where, isn't that the same email we just saw? Eric, please go to the first page of the email. There you go. Okay. Vassar says the malpractice issue may be one that we can resolve. That's referring to the previous email about malpractice insurance, right? See that? I see that, sir. Now, my question to you is, did Vassar, your direct subordinate, tell you, you know what, we're looking at Brown, I'm done a draft contract for Brown, but he doesn't have malpractice insurance. Is that a problem? Did he tell you that? I don't remember that, sir. Don't remember it? I do not. Can we agree, as, as of September of 2020, that your subordinate had drafted a contract for Joe Brown and was talking through the scope, et cetera, of the representation? These documents appear to reflect that, sir. Let's go to exhibit seven within 127, Eric. Bring up, Eric, if you would, uh, the email from Mr. Brass Vassar to Mr. Kamick on September 4, 2020. Can you see and confirm, sir, that at the same time that Vassar was sending draft contract, or at around the same time he was sending a draft contract to Mr. Brown, he was doing the same with Mr. Kamick? I can read the email. I don't think I was copied on the email, so I'm, I'm seeing it here for the first time. And of course, We'd already seen from the other email there was a malpractice insurance issue with Mr. Brown, right? I, I saw on that Mr. Vassar said it was resolved. 
But there was no such issue with Mr. Kamek, was there? Highlight that, Eric. I'm sorry, Mr. I don't know. His... I don't see it mentioning malpractice insurance. Right. So as we looked at these three people, one of them's too expensive, one of them doesn't have malpractice insurance, and the other one's, he's young, but he doesn't really have to do a whole lot. He's just got to do more than Penley, right? <laughs> I, again, sir, I would not characterize it that way at all. And let's go to Exhibit 9 within 127. Here, if the jury wants to see the actual contract sent by your subordinate to Mr. Kamek, they can look at this exhibit. You see it there? What I, what's on the screen right now is a letter. Well, it says Brent Webster at the top. That's because would have he been had after to collect me. all the emails. Say that again. That's sir. because he collected all the emails. Okay. So it says Webster at the top, and it says from Ryan Vassar. It doesn't say who it's to, except it says general. Right. This was the contract that Vassar wanted to use with both Kamek and Brown, and a copy was provided to the general. Do you see that? I see what the email says. Okay. Now, you've told us all that you objected to hiring Kamek, and the reason you objected is because you thought Penley could handle it and said he was handling it, right? That's part, yes. And Penley did not want somebody to come in and do it. He said he was going to do it himself, but he was just waiting on documents, right? That's part, yes. Okay. And so as, we, as the executive approval process went forward, it stopped at Penley, right? That's my recollection, yes, sir. Let's look at AG Exhibit 130. And as we're pulling that on the screen, just tell us point blank, does, does, how long had Penley been at the office as of this time? That's a good question, sir. I hope my, all of my questions are good. Some are. Some, okay. How long had Penley been at the office as of September 2020? Yeah, I, Mere like months, right? Mm, Eight months at max, right? I, I, I honestly did not have a rec recollection of when he started. I know when I came in, Adrian McFarlane um, was the deputy. She retired it at a point. We recruited, we were looking for the position, Mr. Paxton had known Mark, recommended him highly, and so he became, you know, part of our team. How long? I, months? I, I mean, I, I guess ask Mr. Penley. I, I will. What we have on the screen is the executive approval memorandum with regard to the outside counsel contract for Mr. Kamek, right? Um, can you, well, you jump down to the ray real quick? I'm sorry, if you could go down to the, I see it's the executive approval memo, I see the list of names. C can I see the- Synopsis? The, the, yeah, the, well, the ray line will, will help first. Now, Ray, he's asking for the ray line, please. Oh, I, yeah, I see that. I'm not seeing it on this page. It's there. What Eric, it? it's in bold, ray. Yeah, I see, I, I see the ray, but I, I'm, what I'm, I'm sorry, and I keep going back and forth because I'm trying to look at it. Um, what I'm not seeing is Kamek referenced. If you say the next pages are Kamek, I'm not going to dispute that, obviously. Okay. The document speaks for itself. Sure. Let's look at the people that approved it. Let me ask you this. Any of these, none of these people can veto the Attorney General, can they? None of these people can veto the Attorney General, but our processes were in place to protect him and to protect the agency that you had proper sign off. I'm not asking about your processes, your bureaucrat processes. I'm asking about legally. None of these people can veto the attorney general, can they? I mean, that's a tough question for me to answer. Why? You should know that, should you not? If you're the first assistant, that's something you should absolutely know by now, right? 
None of these people, none of these people have the legal authority to veto the Attorney General. Isn't that true? I think if the Attorney General is taking an action that is improper, then it's incumbent on the staff, and that's why these processes are, are in place. Improper so, according so to... So I don't, I don't think it's proper, for, in, for instance, that Dan Morales goes out and enters into a deal. I'm not talking about Greg Dan Greg Abbott Morales. went out and entered into a deal. I mean, the process, the, it's the agency, and the agency has, I mean, I know you're, 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 you're making comments about the process and bureaucratic, and, and look, it, it may be, but there's a reason. It is. There are reasons, I mean, the Attorney General can't on his own go out, because when this legislature, they give authority for the agency to act, right? They give, you can do a certain thing. For instance, in the government code, one of the provisions in the government code, Mr. Busby, I'm sorry, I don't, you're not answering my question. Well, I am right. answering your question. Okay. Just, one, one of the, one of the, in the government code, the legislature has given the Office of Attorney General the authority to enter into outside, outside council contracts. That's authority given. In addition, this legislature gives money so that you have money to actually, so you need money and you need authority. And so when you ask the question, could an attorney general do that? I mean, he needs to have authority and there has to be funds to do it. These processes are in place. You finished? I was trying to answer your question. You're telling the members of this jury, each of them, a senator elected by the people, that a bureaucrat in the office has the authority to veto the boss. What that's I'm what you're trying to suggest to us, are you not? What I'm try if I can, can I answer your question? I, that's what, I'm I trying, what I'm trying to suggest to you is this legislature gives authority to the agency. They say what the agency can do. We have the Constitution. We have the statutes. Part of that is also money. Hmm. The Attorney General is responsible for the policies and the procedures of the office. Is that right? The Attorney General is responsible for the policies and the procedures in the office. He makes the policies and procedures for his own office, does he not? He at one point approved those. I think these policies and procedures were in place before he were, became Attorney General. They were put in place by Greg Abbott. They're policies and procedures created by the holder of the office. They can be modified and changed by the office holder however she or he sees fit. Isn't that true? I think that's true. Okay. But here you are telling us all, or trying to suggest to us all, that, that the Attorney General, the elected Attorney General of the state of Texas, has to get the approval of his staff to enter an outside contract. That's what you're saying, is it not? What, what I'm saying is, in addition to having the, the legislature also sets the parameters of that authority, part of the job as the staff is to make sure the office is following what the legislature has granted. In fact, Let's see, we know on the first page that Leslie French, the general counsel, she signed off, true? I, I see that, yes, sir. Joshua Godby, he signed off, true? True. Ryan Vassar, who wrote the contract, he signed off, right? Yes. Michelle Price, the controller, that's the, the woman in charge of the money, she signed off, right? Yes. It stopped with Mr. Penley, right? That is true. And this outside counsel contract was being done to do the job that Mr. Penley was supposed to be doing. Isn't that true? You keep asking that question and I keep telling you I don't have that same view. Sure. And let's go to, Eric, if we could, page 14011 of the same document. It's the signature page. One four zero one one, and here's the signature page. True. And that appears to be the signature page. Contract is written where the attorney general is to sign. Is that right? Well, what it says, sir, is attorney general or designee. And I think I said on my direct examination, it was very rare that the attorney general himself actually signed contracts. Sure. In fact. 
when the attorney general did sign a contract, we actually had a special folder envelope that you'd put it in. There were some requirements of some contracts. I think they were things from the feds that they required actually the actual signature of the attorney general. Right. There are some things that the, the, the attorney general could not designate. Uh, that he th had, can you let me finish, please? Yeah, I'm, I apologize. Okay. Uh, yes. There's some things that he had to sign, right? There are a few things he had to sign. Usually, I think they were federal requirements. And most of the time, though, he designated someone to sign on his behalf, right? Well, again, most of the time, in my experience, as first assistant, it was the first assistant. But that does not mean he cannot sign, does it? Does it? No. Okay. Penley had a real problem with hiring Kamek, true? Penley had a problem with hiring Kamek, correct. So Penley refused to sign off, and that stopped the process, right? That's correct. Are you telling me you did not know that Vassar had drafted a contract? Is that what you're trying to tell us? And I'm, what I'm trying to tell you is, 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 is the best of my recollection, and the best of the recollection is I don't recall that. No, well, sir. Certainly at some point you knew because you talked about conversations you had with the general where he was asking, he was wondering why Penley wouldn't sign the contract. You knew the contract existed, right? I knew that they were entertaining the fact of a contract. So I would assume, yes. Eric, Exhibit 127, Exhibit 34 within that document, please. All right, looking at Exhibit 34 within 127, we see here kind of the, the DocuSign history, true? If that's what you say, it, I, can't, I don't dispute that. It says DocuSign. They just highlighted that. One of the good things about DocuSign is you can see exactly when somebody viewed the document. You can see if somebody rejects the document. You can see when they sign the document. Would you agree with that? I'm seeing this for the first time. It's common sense, though, is it the, not? The document says that. Well, I, again, I think we both agreed. Neither of us are tech people. Um, I mean, I, he, Eric is highlighting, and, and I see what that says. So let's look at Penley's history. Mr. Penley, according to DocuSign and the document that's in evidence, it was sent to him. That is, the Kamek contract was sent to him on September 16th, 2020. Do you see that? I, they're going to have to enlarge it for me, sir. September 16th, 2020. He was sent the document. True? Yeah, it looks like it's 6.43, 14 p.m. Is that what you're referring to? He didn't view the document until the day y'all sent the text. Did he? I think there's a record. I mean, that's what this says, but I know there was an exhibit that, that he sends an email on September 24th that he attaches or tries to attach the DocuSign. And of course, you can't attach one. It was just the fact that, that one had been sent to him. Shows us here that he declined the document at 3.03 p.m. on October 1st. And then he viewed it after he had declined it an hour later. Isn't that what that shows? It, the document says what it says. I don't have any knowledge. Now, your position is I was adamantly against the Attorney General hiring Kamek, right? I believe Mr. Kamek did not 
have the type of experience necessary to assist Mr. Penley in the investigation. You compare him to someone like Joe Brown, who had been a U.S. attorney, who had been actually a, a DA. I mean, there, there, there's no comparison in experience. Could he issue subpoenas? Could he get s subpoenas issued? Could who? Mr. Kamek? Brown? Mr. Kamek. Well, did we he know. Have the, did well, he have the wherewithal to get subpoenas issued? Well, we know that he eventually did with assistance from Mr. Paul's lawyer. Do you know how those subpoenas were actually? I don't, I don't want to talk about what you might have read in the paper. I want to ask you about what you know. Do you know how Mr. Kamek I have was? <laughs> can you let me finish? Well, you asked me a question. I'm getting ready to about finish the paper. The Just a second, sir. Do you know specifically how Mr. Kamek got subpoenas issued? Do you know how that process worked? I do not. You claimed to the FBI that he appeared in front of the grand jury, didn't you? That's what you told the FBI, didn't you? I don't think I told that to the FBI. What we know happened instead was, is he was assisted by the Travis County DA's office and was sent a subpoena draft with a DocuSign that he DocuSigned. I think that's a better question directed at the Travis County DA's office, Ms. So Moore. Did you ever bother even to ask how the subpoenas Mr. Kamek sent were issued? I, I, I didn't because I didn't need to. Y'all were uh, drafting collectively, you and the other employees or ex-employees were drafting a letter to send to the FBI or the, or the Texas Rangers? Do you have something to show me? Do you not recall drafting a letter where y'all were sending drafts back and forth amongst yourselves? of a correspondence you were going to send to the authorities? If, if you have something to show me, I, that may have refreshed my memory. Let's look at Exhibit 22, please, within the same uh, Exhibit 127. Go to page, the pages aren't numbered, but go to number four within the document, please, Eric. Go all the way to the bottom, Eric. This, uh, it's very difficult to, to point this out, but it's the, the sentence starts, the subpoena sought information that involve financial records at local banks. Bring that. Go to number four, Eric. I'm sorry, Eric. It's uh, you're two pages off. Here we go. Eric, just go to the second to last page, please. Second to last page of the document. You were...
The Senate starts, I mean, this, this is something that you guys were collectively drafting, is it not? I, I, I don't know if I've ever seen this, Mr. Busby. You, we took it off your computer. Off my computer? Well, the computer's from the office, yeah. There were multiple drafts that y'all were Mateer, sitting around. Was it Jeff Mateer's computer? Can you show me that? Well, let, let's, let's. It said at the beginning, you know, you've been jumping around. This is one of the disadvantages. Of, I know. Of I'm at disadvantage too because my guy's way over there. And I, I know. I understand. It, we both are frustrated. Let with me it. just let me just focus your attention on some language of a but, draft but letter, pardon me, and then you can tell Honor, me whether you pardon, wrote it. Pardon me, everyone. My objection is he doesn't know the source of this. He doesn't believe where it came from. It's totally inappropriate for him to be asked questions about it. To Mr. Busby shows what he came from, so he's satisfied it's something that he knows something about. Let me, I can handle that, Your Honor. Sure. Can you help straighten that out? Yes, sir. Right. No doubt. Did you realize that Ryan Banger, on the behalf of all of you so-called whistleblowers, was drafting a letter to be sent to either the FBI or the Rangers? I, I don't have memory of that. Did he share with you any of the drafts that he created that was ultimately sent to the authorities? Th this is very... You don't, don't remember? Know. I don't remember, sir. Okay, let me just see if your recollection of the things that were going on. Would you agree with the statement that nothing in the subpoenas sought information that related to the allegations contained in the Travis County complaint, which involved potential criminal conduct by employees of state and federal? This related to the first one? Yeah. yeah I mean, I, again, you're reading from this document. Yeah. I'm just trying to... I mean, I would ask, I mean, again... What I would ask is what you will do. I assume I would ask Mr. Banger because I, I don't recall. I'm trying to get it, figure out pardon, what y'all thought me again, you Pardon knew. me again. This, this entire line, Your Honor, is so misleading. If I'm right, and I'll be corrected, I'll be glad to be corrected from all. I believe what we have here is an excerpt from the 50-something page OAG report. What this is, it's a self-serving version of, the, of their report that he's being asked about as if it's something that first that he wrote, and if not, then something that, that was written by someone else. And he's acting like this was a fact that they did something. He needs to disclose to this witness where this comes from. It's not coming from his computer. He doesn't have any knowledge whether it's coming from anyone else's computer. This entire line is unfair and, and, and wrong for the witness. If he tells him where it's coming from, and then ask him if it's right, I won't object. But this, is, this kind of shooting in the dark is inappropriate. Your Honor, Mr. Hardin, if he, if he looked at the document, would know that this came from Ryan Banger's computer, that it was a letter that he was drafting on behalf of all of the so-called whistleblowers, and there are things in the letter that I think is a misconception that they all had collectively, which was they didn't know about the second referral. That's why I'm asking these and, questions. And I, I've said that, Mr. Busby. Okay. And that's what, that's alarmed you. He's sending subpoenas to banks and it has nothing to do with the first referral, right? That was one of the things that alarmed us, I think I've said. Yeah. Is it, may I ask for a predicate for these questions, Your Honor, is this document that he's been asking him from, from the Attorney General's offices self-serving document they published to the world as to their version of events. If that's where it's from, then I can go to the page of that report and determine that. But this witness needs to know that's what it is rather than suggesting it came from his computer or somebody else's computer. I'm, this did I'm, not, I, I would respectfully okay. suggest He's taking up credit. my time and he, if he Give read the, the documents that's in evidence, this document is in evidence, he knows that it came directly from Ryan Bangert's computer he doesn't and he know knows any that such Ryan thing. Ba please. He One knows second. that Ryan Banger circulated this so they could get their facts right before they sent this correspondence to the authorities. And that's all I ask him is, I, I is this true that none of you knew, he's... none of you knew about the second referral and that's why you're all so upset. That's the point. And I think the point's been made. Let's move on. Okay. Your, Your Honor, this document, it looks like this document was, was prepared by Mr. Brent Webster. No, geez, come on. You need to look closely at the documents. Very clear, prepared by Ryan Banger. Now, all right. It looks like. I'm Are you corrected. satisfied now? It looks like it's two other people, but it is not this man. I'd I'd say, I'd, Your Honor, I made that clear. It's Ryan Banger. I've said it three excuse times. Excuse me. You've okay. testified repeatedly, Mr. Busby, that this man knows X. 
This, the only way you're going to know what he knows is to ask him questions rather than suggest it was done by somebody else. <clears throat> Which is so what I was I'm objecting to improper I mean, predicate to this question. Okay. Let's Thank just you. move on. Sure. Thank you. Trying to. Now. Do you know who Bailey Molnar is? Say that again, sir. Sorry. Do you know who Bailey Molnar is? Spell the last name. M-O-L-N-A-R. Works at the Travis County District Attorney's Office. I don't want to say she's a clerk, but she does administrative type work. I don't think I do. Excuse me, sir. I don't think I do. So you wouldn't have any role in, in her assistance with Kamek in issuing subpoenas? Um, no. Okay. Now, you had asked, and your, and your lawyer, or the uh, House's lawyer had complained that, hey, show him the second referral. You'd like to see it, right? You've never seen it. If you show it to me, I guess I'll... Exhibit 127, Exhibit 13. Okay. Have you seen this document before? I'm still reading it, sir. Thank you. Have you had a ch chance to read it? I, I'm sorry, I don't read. I read fast, but not that fast. helps. Thank you, Eric. What we have on the screen here is what has been referred to as the second referral. Would you confirm with me that this document, this referral, was sent from the DA's office of Travis County directly to Mr. Kamick in Houston, Texas in September, on September 23, 2020. Well, what I confirm is it's dated September 23rd. The address that's listed is not an office of the Attorney General of Texas. Now, do you know who Don Clemmer is? Don Clemmer, I do know who Don Clemmer is. Who is Don Clemmer? He used to work at the Office of Attorney General before I was there. Okay. Uh, I believe worked um, with Adrian McFarland. Actually, he might have been uh, in a deputy position at one time for when Governor Abbott was General Abbott. I'm asking, okay, sir, do you see where he, how he I'm listens? i to answer your question. I understand sorry. what you're doing. Can you tell me and confirm that at or around September 2020, he worked at the DA's office for Travis County? I know he worked at the DA's office. I don't know what his position was, but I see that a letter says what his position is. Yeah, it says Director, Special Prosecutions Division. See that? I do see that, yes, sir. And, and you told us that Clemmer used to work at the AG's office, right? Before my time, yes. Right, so you know that the AG's office is not in Houston, Texas, and he would know that too, right? He would know that the Office of Attorney General is not in Houston, Texas, right? Well, no, we do have an office in, in Houston. We actually have several offices. I just know that address was not one of our offices. Right, right. So he would know... Well, I, I, you'd have to, I mean, obviously you're asking me a question that you know, I don't know the answer to, but he would know the answer to. Sure. Yeah. So rather than sending the referral to Penley or Maxwell, the second referral was sent directly to the outside counsel, Brandon Kamen. Right? This letter says that. I don't know why that was done. And you had no idea about this referral until sometime well after this, isn't that right? That's correct.
Now, who is Lisa Tanner? Lisa Tanner was a, it may still be, Lisa Tanner was a prosecutor at the time I was there in the criminal division. She's, you want more? She's one of the key prosecutors for the state of Texas, or was. Now, on, um, did you ever, did you ever want, uh, let me ask it this way. Did you ever discuss with Mr. Clemmer uh, outside counsel for the AG's office? I don't know if I've ever met Mr. Clemmer. Okay, I'm not asking that. I'm asking whether you discuss via phone, oh. email, anything like that with Mr. Clemmer. Again, I, I don't think I've ever had a discussion with Mr. Clemmer. Okay. Do you know what the subject was of the uh, second referral? Do you know what Mr. Paul was alleging? No, you'd have to show it to me. Okay. Do we have the second one? This is in evidence. I'm going to offer into evidence uh, House 168. It's the second criminal complaint filed by Nate Paul. Any objection? No objection. Entered into evidence. We don't have a hard copy? All right. Eric, uh, go to the second page, please. Next page, please. Go to page six. All right. And the jury, to the extent they want to look at it, can see uh, in exhibit house 168 the nature of Nate Paul's complaints. And you didn't know anything about this. That's what I, you told us. If you want me to... I, I, I don't want to waste it. a lot of time on it. I just want to make sure the jurors know that there is a second referral and it was the genesis of it was Nate Paul complained to the Travis County DA's office. I mean, if that's what you're saying, obviously the document is what it is. I'm not absent me sitting and reading it. I'm not able to answer. Okay. Now, you told me, I think, that... If you're going to hire outside counsel at the AG's office, you need to go through the procedure, right? Yes, sir. That it's absolutely essential that if the DA, when you talked about the legislature and the money and, 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 and the codes and the, and the policy, it all needs to be followed if you're going to, if you are going to hire, that is, the AG's office is going to hire outside counsel, right? Yes. That's to actually hire and execute a contract, you have to go through the process. Right, and, and, and that includes getting approval from the controller in that process to fund it, doesn't it? That you have to have money that the legislature has allocated. And you told us, I think you told us, that that is in place to protect the office. Yes, in part, yes. That is in place so things are done above board and on the up and up, right? Yes. Let's look at AG Exhibit 368. and go to the second to last page. Now, let's focus on this all together. Given what you told us, 
given your objections to the elected attorney general and hiring Mr. Kamek or anybody outside, what we have here is an email from you the day before you resigned to Lacey May, Mays, Mays, where you authorized the use of $50,000 for outside counsel. What is that? What is it? Mm -hmm. That's what I was talking about exactly in order to have a contract. What, what contract is that for? It was, it says what it says. It was, it was, we were considering at this point in time whether the agency would enter into an outside counsel contract with Johnny Sutton. Wait. In order to do that, if, can I complete my answer? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. In order to do that, you have to have funds set aside. You can't just enter into a contract. You have to have the funds set aside. This is part of the process. What would have followed Mr. Busby is the full process, but obviously there isn't such a contract because we did not proceed. Wow, okay, let me make sure I got this. You are the first deputy, it, it, I mean, it's first her, assistant, yeah. I'm call, I'm, I don't mean you any offense, I just I know, I know you up. don't. You're the first assistant. You're sending an email to Lacey Mays authorizing $50,000 of our taxpayers money for an outside counsel, Johnny Sutton. Is that right? That is, that is correct. <laughs> Setting aside those funds in the event we did ultimately enter into a contract, but we did not. Well, you certainly did. Johnny Sutton's your lawyer right now, isn't he? He didn't enter into a contract with the agency. Let me ask you something. Let's be clear. Answer my question to the jury. They may want to know, is Johnny Sutton your lawyer right now? Johnny Sutton is my personal lawyer. Is he sitting right over there? Yep, I see him. Okay. You tell me what authority you had as first assistant to set aside our taxpayer money to hire an outside counsel. You tell me that. I had the authority to set aside the funds because the next step in the process would have been to go through the executive approval memo process. And if all of the deputies would have signed off on it and we had made the determination that that was in the best interest of the state to retain Mr. Count, Mr. Sutton as, as counsel. For who? For the state. For what? Because we were looking into potential crimes that were being committed. You, this, the, you, <laughs> did, you tell, did you tell your boss that you were allocating 50K for an outside contract, outside counsel contract? If he had come to the meeting on October, can I finish? Are you done? Yeah, I know you're getting excited. Just let me finish. Well, I am because this is. Take it easy. You're, you're trying to misstate things. Please. Let's Did you settle down here. Just answer the question. I'm sorry, Mr. President. You know, we had to get, we had to find this forensically. Did you know that? I, no, uh, I don't know why I turned in my computer. I don't know why either. But let's be clear about what you did, about what you did, the loyal servant, trusted friend. Yeah, I never got to answer the question. I'm going to answer, ask it. Yes and ask. Just wait for the question. What authority did My you? My objection is if you'll quit the commercials and testify and just ask the objection, I don't have it. But when he puts all these kind of accolades in there that he is just making fun of the witness in his question, I strenuously object. He can ask a simple question, but not with all these commercials from his what's side of the, the case. What's the objection? My objection is that he is, has no foundation and basis for asking questions. He is simply harassing the witness by putting a lot of adjectives in there that he thinks serves him. He's not asking a question. He has for about two hours testified, and I've been very patient about it. His questions are testimony. They are not questions. That particular one, if we read back, he starts going on all of these little commercials for his point of view, and I object. Again, let's just move on. Sure, sir. Thank what you. authority did you have to secretly go behind your boss's back and allocate $50,000 for outside counsel contract? What authority? What, who gave you that authority? I, I can't answer that question because what you said is absolutely incorrect. Show me a first statute. off, first off, sir, 
I asked, we asked to meet with the Attorney General on this date. If we'd had a meeting, had he come, had he come, had he been here, we could have had a discussion. And perhaps Mr. Sutton could have assisted even him at this point. Let's look at AG Exhibit 361. And go to page seven, Eric. Lacey Mays took your authorization and sent it to the controller, right? I mean, this is part of an email. I don't see the the first part of it, again, I don't think I'm copied on it. Your Honor, I do not show that this one is in evidence. And it should be taken down on the, from the screen for the Senate until we find out whether it is. Sorry, I don't even understand the objection. This is in evidence. He's saying it's not in evidence. He's saying it's not in evidence at this point. Uh, it is in evidence. We offered it into evidence, and if, to the extent that he doesn't know that, we'll offer it again. Can, can we see the exhibit number, please? AG 361. 361. Yeah, okay. Do you object? I'd... Bring that up. Yeah, that's what I... All right, so... So real briefly, Your Honor, uh, this is not one of those that was agreed. It was provided to us this morning, an amendment to their list, and we didn't, I don't even think we still have a copy of it, a physical copy of it, and it's not an exhibit that was part of the agreement everybody reached overnight. So the problem is we don't have a copy of this. I'm sure he's got about to bring it. Would you provide a copy? Uh, we can get a copy. It's, it's now been up on the computer as an inadmissible piece of evidence for about five minutes. Yes. Thank you. Oh. We'll take it. We'll take it down until we resolve this. Just take it down for a moment, not you, off of the computers on the desk. Three, we offer 361, Your Honor. Uh, well, we're going to object, and certainly we may change our mind later, but this is actually an excerpt from a forensic report that we've never had disclosed to her. It's never been part of discovery, and quite frankly, the report was generated on September the 14th of 2021, and they have never blank, blank, blank produced it. And now they, while the witness is on the stand, they start talking to it. In very understated, kind, and gentle terms, this is outrageous. It violates every rule the Senate had about discovery. And you've enter, entered multiple orders, as, as you know, and as you've mentioned. This is not the way the process is supposed to work. And we do object. It's a... They did. You know, Your Honor, you know what's ironic is we got this, we're told from them. <laughs> we got this document from them. Oh, it validates everything. I mean, I, did, I would have mentioned that, Your Honor, if I'd have known it, but I've just told that in my ear. And, and, of course, it's emails between people in the office, including this man here. I don't think I'm okay. on that email, sir. The witness, just hold for a moment. That was a question. Is it your document, Counselor, I, I from, from you all? 
I, I can tell you that we, the trial team, have never seen this document and never knew that it was going to be proposed as an exhibit. I will, uh, when they say that they got it from us, I don't know how they got it from us unless the Attorney General, this is produced by the Attorney General's office. This is not produced by us. I don't know. We'd have to look during the break. We can try to do that because I think that's upcoming. I, I will be glad to inform the court if it turns out that this document was given to us. We will tell you that. But that is still not the way admissibility should be. If they're going to offer an expert report in, in any kind of – this should have been disclosed a long time ago. It's a good time to take a 10-minute break. We've been here for 90 minutes, uh, and you can take a look at it. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Judge.